we'll continue our study in Romans chapter 1, but let us turn real quick to Ephesians chapter 4. And this is the scripture I intended us to close on last week, but it will be a good starting point for us this week. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 18. Here the apostle writes, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Amen. That is the natural state of man. They are, their understanding is darkened, their hearts are blinded. Right. They walk after the, to the vanity of their mind. They're, they're the, Unprofitableness, emptiness that is in the natural mind. It's what they follow after. Mm -hmm. That only leads them farther and farther away from God. You're right. We can go back to Romans chapter 1 now, though, and <laughs> building upon that thought of having their hearts and understandings darkened. Verse number 22 through 25, or we're going to look at today. After he said it, there. Their imaginations were vain, their hearts were darkened and foolish. He says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools mm -hmm. and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve Creature more than the Creator is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. <coughs> well, here we begin with that they profess themselves to be wise. That literally means they're self proclaimed philosophers, or learned men, or even theologians. Yet their wisdom is not of God, their wisdom is of this world and of the carnal mind. And there is a wisdom that's of this world, a wisdom that is of God, and they are not the same. They are usually contrary one to another. You bet. But man, seems like, especially in our day, thinks himself as really wise and smart, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He's just about got everything figured out, he thinks. Yet, in so professing that, they really become a fool before God. Right. We'll turn over to First Corinthians for a moment. We'll look at First Corinthians chapter one. First, First Corinthians chapter one. We looked here a few weeks ago how that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save souls. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Kind of continuing on that same thought here in verse number 20 through verse 29. Scripture says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the suitor of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Mm -hmm. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Mm -hmm. Notice he says that by wisdom they knew not God. You can learn and become as wise as you want to in the ways of this world, but that will never lead you to God. Amen. Scientists ought to be proof enough of that. that they've studied this creation, and yet they just go farther and farther away from God, rather than that. They're learning, leading them towards God. Going on here, going verse 22, he says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. If you recall, the Greeks were very you know, high-class people by their day standards. They sought after much learning. In fact, a lot of our modern science and physics are based upon things that they learned and discovered. Right. Yet that wisdom wasn't what leads them to God. Neither did the signs that the Jews wanted. But notice verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified and the Jews a stumbling block and the Greeks foolishness. 
But uh, unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The Christ is what we are to seek after, not Amen. Not signs and wonders, not wisdom and knowledge. Simply Christ and faith in Him. Verse number 25 goes on to say, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Not that there's any foolishness with God, but what the world perceives as foolishness. He said, Even that is wiser than men are. Amen. Even that is greater than the wisest of men. There's no weakness with God either, but what the world perceives as weakness, that is greater than the strongest of men. Verse 26, he says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world, and things which are despised of God chosen, yea, things which are not, and to bring to naught things that are, and no flesh should glory in his presence. Amen. God Certainly he can save the, the mighty, the noble, and the wise men, but oftentimes he uses the opposite, doesn't he? The, <clears throat> he says here, the foolish things, the simple things, the weak things, the, the people who are of low degree. Right. That way he says that no flesh would glory in his presence. Amen. That, Really, it's nothing that we are or we can do, but that God would use us. God, if He so wanted to, could use the scientists to figure out that there is a God, that there is biblical creation, and that the Bible is true. If they really wanted, they really studied it in accordance with the Word of God, they could see that science confirms the Bible. But right. God doesn't need science to, to prove his existence. You're right. And he requires us to live by faith. But God oftentimes chooses that which is contrary to the thinking of man, the logic of man. That way man will not boast before God. Amen. But going back to our text, these here, they thought themselves to be wise, yet Word of God says they became fools. So man is really so ascended in his quote wisdom that the things of God become foolish to him. And even today we have them denying the existence of God. God says the fool is in his heart, there is no God. Right. Mm -hmm. the man has some so become hope learned that he has forgotten God. That's what really Paul is saying here, that they become wise, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. Right. That they learn their way away from God, if you will. So there's nothing wrong with learning, nothing wrong with knowing how the physical world works. They said with the right understanding, it will show you even more evidence of God. But you're right. The natural man tries to always use those things to explain away God, to try to interpret those things in a godless way. You know, I know the scripture says that when God parted the Red Sea, that he sent a strong wind. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what kind of physical means exactly that was, but yet I know God uses physical means often. Mm -hmm. You can be sure that it wasn't just some nor'easter regular storm that came along and Israelites just so happened to be there. <laughs> Amen. It wasn't, God says specifically that he prepared a great fish or a whale that is sometimes called a swallow of Jonah. The man would say, well, that's physically impossible. Yet we know God prepared that fish for Jonah. You're right. Said so man, his natural state tries to interpret the things of God from a corrupt viewpoint, and that always leads him away from God, or trying to explain away 
the miracles of God. Mm -hmm. Let's go on in our text in verse 23. It says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like an uncorruptible man. Well, they change the glory of God. Not that God's glory can physically be changed, but because he is incorruptible, it says here, or uncorruptible, that he is, does not, cannot sin, he was not affected by the curse, at least not in his person and nature like man was. Mm -hmm. really the, his glory is the splendor of who he is, the brightness of who he is. And man can change his view of that, man can change his idea of that, man can try to make God as something else, but God himself cannot be changed. Amen. Let's turn back to Exodus for a moment. I know it's a, probably a familiar passage for us, but Exodus chapter 33. We see the glory of God literally on display here in Exodus 33, verse 18 through 23. If you're familiar with this passage, Moses was on the mount and conversing with God, he wanted to see God face to face. Verse number 18 of Exodus 33 says, And he said, Moses, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he, speaking of God, said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Amen. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. Amen. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back part, but my face shall not be seen. And that is the glory of God that one day we'll, we'll one day see in all of its glory. We get that. We always got a little glimpse of it. We know it changed him really the rest of his life. And when he came down, he was shining so bright he had to put a veil on him. Amen. And that glory of God can man has tried to change it to be less than what it is. Man has tried to change God to be something equal to creation rather than the creator himself. As it says here, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man. You know, man, for I don't know how long, has tried to make a God that's like himself. Right. You know, one that's been corrupted by sin, one that will overlook sin and not judge it harshly. One that's even affected by feelings and passions and changings of society. And now man presents a God that's okay with what his own word is called abomination. Mm -hmm. But yet, the God of the Bible, he cannot be corrupted by sin. He cannot be changed into a, to be like corruptible man. Amen. Let's turn to the Psalms, chapter 50. We'll get to this later in the book of Romans. I know Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet without sin, and in the flesh condemned sin. But he was still very much God in that sinless body. Amen. Psalm chapter 50, verse 21 and 22. It says, These things hast thou done, I kept silence. Thou, thou this is God speaking. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. He says that man thought that God was just like them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said well, he's going to reprove them one day and set them in order. God is long suffering mm -hmm. in our time. He is very merciful and gracious. One day you can be sure he's coming back to 
a flaming fire taking vengeance upon all them that know not God. Amen. God is not going to just gloss over sin for You're right. all eternity. You know, we should, I think we can see it in our own nation now that sin has caused us issues. We see it over and over in the nation of Israel. They go back to God, say, well, we're going to serve you. And then they go back to sin and they start <laughs> struggling as a nation. And then right. They cry out to God again. We're really not that much different, but you're right. See, God is not as man is and just going to be okay with sin. He's not just going to wink at it and say, Well, you can get a freebie this time. <laughs> right. He's not going to be changed by the way society looks at things different now. Society thinks fornication's okay, the sodomy's okay, and they think that a little lying is okay. Lots of things that are acceptable. Mm -hmm. You know, God has not changed. You're right. He changed to like corruptible man. He said, I don't mean you serve a God that's like man. You serve a God who's ever changing, a God who puts his approval on sin, but the God of the Bible is not such. Amen. He goes on to say that they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, the image made like the corruptible man, but also it's just the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So besides ascribing the attributes of God to man himself, sometimes man attributes those things to nature, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. We see that with, quote, Mother Nature and mm. many of the other false religions of the world worship the elements of nature. Well, some even have little animals that they worship. Right. You go to India, you better not try to eat a hamburger. Because <laughs> to the Hindus, the cows are sacred animals. Well, another example is Baphomet, he is a a goat-like creature that is worshipped by some. Right. I know it's not as prevalent maybe as it once was, but yet man has makes himself gods of nature very often. We see it with Aaron and the Israelites. And Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. You know, Aaron is story uh, we just threw in the golden out pop this golden calf <laughs> but man all throughout history has made himself idols like in the animals and other things of creation the worship so, but yet you can be sure god is not part of his creation but is very much in control of his creation amen man one three says he had his way in the world went in the storm Matthew 5, 45 says he sends rain on just and the unjust, causes the sun to shine on the good and the evil. So Nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way that God is so sovereign over all. Amen. After spending, I forget, it was seven years living as a beast of the field, it says his understanding returned to him and he praised and extolled the Most High God and said, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What do is thou? Well, God is not like man or nature. God is sovereign over all. Amen. Yet man, his corrupt understanding, always tries to bring God down to his level. Or even sometimes take upon himself the nature and the glory that belongs to God. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to verse. 24 it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. It says, God gave them up to this uncleanness, this moral impurity or wrongness, it's to be spiritually filthy. And this was the nature that was in them. God didn't have to turn them and make them sinful, He just had to 
as they were giving them up, uh, remove his restraining hand, and that will be the natural course for every man. Right. To follow after uncleanness, as it says here, through the lust of their own hearts. So if God did not have to drive them to wickedness, their own hearts led them there. We turn over to Matthew, or just go Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, verse number 16, through verse number 20. Here are the Pharisees, I think it was, that tried to uh, condemn the disciples for eating with unwashed hands. And in his rebuke of them, he says, Verse 16, and Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do ye not understand that whatsoever entereth into the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the draught? He says, Those things which you go in, they're going to come out in the right for us as a septic or the sewer system. But that's not what defiles a man, he says. But those, verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. Amen. For out of the heart proceed. Evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. I know that our last few years everything's been about washing hands and <laughs> using hand sanitizer. Nothing wrong with those things, but that's not what defiles a man. It's what comes out from within the heart, it says. Amen. Within the heart of man is where his true nature lies, whether it's Still that corrupt heart of the other God has given you a new heart, a new nature. And that's what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. If you're still in your sin, you will fall after that corrupt nature. So without the restraining hand of God, all of us would have followed after that and stay in that course. You're right. We go back to chapter 12 of Matthew. Chapter 12, verse 35, after I think he had, see, 12, verse 35 says, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes a difference, whether you ever, not that we're good within ourselves, but we're God has made us good. That's it. We'll bring forth that which is good. If we're still evil, if our nature is still corrupt, we're going to bring forth that which is evil. As the other scripture says, the evil tree will bring forth evil fruit, and the that tree will bring forth good fruit. In fact, that's just a few verses prior to where we just read. The apple tree is going to bear apples, and the orange tree is going to bear oranges. Amen. The child of God is going to bear some sort of fruit for God. You can be sure the false professors will still continue on their corrupt way. Amen. In fact, I found that what the scriptures seem to confirm is that when someone tries to come in and clean up their lives and quote, live for God or live a good life, they always return back to their sinful nature. They end up worse off than That's it. Started. Amen. Well, Peter says it's happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog has returned to his vomit, and the salad was mm -hmm. washed to her wall in the mire. Man always returns to his sinful nature if he's never been changed by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to our text here. Verse number 24 of Romans 1. After he says he gave them up to uncleanness to the lust of their hearts, he says to dishonor their own bodies and clean themselves. Many seem to think that it's speaking of sexual sins here, you know, fornication, adultery, sodomy, and so on. Mm -hmm. but whatever it may be here, he, they're willing to do that which is considered shameful and disgraceful even to themselves. Right. 
They're dishonoring their own bodies, he says. He will go on to elaborate on those sexual sins later. Lord will, we'll get to that next week. But man and his own wickedness first will dishonor God and then others and eventually himself. Right. Verse 25, we'll go on. It says, who changed the truth of God into a lie. That word change could also mean exchanged. Much like Adam and Eve did with the serpent. The serpent changed the truth and they were willing to give up the truth for the lie. Right. You shall not surely die, he said. But they did die, didn't they? They didn't physically die that day. Spiritually died, physically they even began to die. Mm -hmm. Amen. But today, it seems that man would rather have a lie that feels good over the truth. You're right. We see that with evolution versus creation, among many other things. <coughs> man would rather have evolved from some monkey or ape like creatures. You've got all sorts of different theories nowadays. That way they are not accountable before God. And you have the professing Christians who try to corroborate the falsehoods of evolution with the Bible. I mean, you, can, you cannot do that either. You cannot take the Word of God and twist it to fit man's thinking. Hey, Amen. Yet that's exactly what these here are done. They've changed the truth of God into a lie. They've either outright exchanged it for a lie or they've twisted the Word of God to fit their own false teachings and heresies. Right. And we see that over and over though throughout the scripture and throughout history that <clears throat> man prefers quote a lie over the truth. Mm hmm. It's the truth that often cuts, doesn't it? Both ways. The truth that often is offensive to the flesh. Amen. It's not well received by this carnal mind. In fact, things over in Phrygian that says that the carnal mind cannot even understand the things of the Spirit. And because of that, they would rather have a lie or rather twisted to fit their own understanding of God. Right. Without the Spirit of God, we will not have a right understanding of the Word of God. The natural man can only go so far in his understanding of God before his corrupt nature <laughs> limits that understanding. Right. He goes on to say here that they change the truth of God to lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. And we see this very plainly in the Roman Catholic Church, don't we? Where they worship Mary and other saints. Mm -hmm. They won't say that they worship them, but they do say they, they venerate them, which is the same thing as worship. Exactly. Amen. They've made Mary co redemptrix with Christ. I don't know where they get. That foolishness from what they've done is they've changed the truth of God into a lie. Mm -hmm. Amen. No, we are to worship God and God alone. He is the only one worthy of our worship. <laughs> Certainly not Mary or any other sinful being. Amen. She was not without sin. She was a very blessed woman, but yet she was not elevated above any other human Amen. in her nature. She was still born of a man, still born of the seed of Adam. Right. We see that today the, the environmentalists, they very much worship the creature more than the creator, don't they? Amen. Absolutely. They worship the earth and the animals. They would, and certainly we should be good caretakers of this world that we're given. Yet we were given this world to, to have dominion over it. We were, as man, given this world to use and to 
really, I guess you could say, and to study and to understand, but yet the earth itself is not a sacred thing. Amen. God, He is the Creator, and He is the only one to be worshipped. Turn to Revelation 4 and 11, real quick. I think I've read this before recently, but <clears throat> this is one of the clearest verses to me about how that God is creator and worthy of our worship. Here are the four and twenty others in heaven are worshiping God. Verse 11, they say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. God and God alone is worthy of this honor, this glory, because He is the Creator God. Amen. He is, He did not create us to worship other things, but rather He created us to worship Him. Mm -hmm. That man, in his sinful nature, always corrupts what God has designed him for to do something else. That man worships false gods, of, whether it's literal idols that have been carved out, or whether it's things such as money, jobs that they've placed before God, of more importance than God. Mm -hmm. Man tries to give the attributes of God to nature or to or even the glory of God to himself, thinking that he is higher than he is. Mm -hmm. But God and God alone is to receive the glory and honor and worship and the praise. As the last part of our text says here, who is blessed forever, amen. This word blessed in scripture is always used of God or Christ and it means adorable, not as in we use adorable today to think of a, a dog or something, but <laughs> one who is to be adored, one who is to be divinely honored and revered, one who is to be praised, that's what this who is blessed forever means. God forever is worthy of our praise and honor and our reverence. He is the only one worthy of our adoration. Amen. Just as creator alone is worthy, that would even more so if we are saved. And do you know the true God, or do you know the God that's been made up by man? Right. And do you worship the God of the Bible, or one which is like unto corruptible things, like unto creation, rather than who is the creator himself? You know, all the wisdom of this world, all the signs and wonders that you could see, all the money that you could possess, none of that will matter if you don't know Christ. Amen. If you don't know the true God, that is what will matter when you stand before him. We'll continue on, Lord will, next week in the downward trend of man and the more and more wickedness. Right. We'll close with that thought. Amen.